Davy Thatcher, you were in crew number seven. This is the famous crew that uh, about the book 30 Seconds Over Tokyo was written. Davy was the engineer gunner on that aircraft. And the engineer gunner on the B-25 was back in the back of the aircraft by himself. He was to operate a top turret gun, 50 caliber gun, up in, in the uh, aft fuselage. There's a crawlway between the rear and the front of the aircraft, but in these aircraft, that crawlway was filled with a, a collapsible gas tank. That's where some of the extra gas was, was placed. Well, Davey, your aircraft, when we've seen motion pictures of that number seven taking off from the carrier, and it took off and then dipped down low and almost hit the wave tops. Dave, were you aware of that sitting in the back of the airplane by yourself? No, I didn't, didn't, didn't notice any, any different than any other takeoffs. Really? <laughs> well, everybody watching it even today thinks you're going to hit the waves, wave tops. Well, I have a question for you. Uh, Lieutenant Lawson, your pilot, elected to land in the water near a beach. And he put the wheels down. As a result, the plane flipped over and he and a co-pilot catapulted through the windshield. Now, what happened to you? What injuries did you have and what did you do after you figured out what had happened? Well, I was knocked unconscious for a while and came to and tried to get out of the bottom of the airplane because the water was coming in there. Finally realized the airplane was upside down and the plexiglass on the turret had shattered and that's where the water was coming in. So I was able to get out through the bottom escape hatch near the tail. When I got out then, I waited to the waited to the tail and the, when I stepped off in the water, the wa water was about waist deep. By that time, the other four crew were up on the beach. What did you do then? The, the, you well, were in Japanese-held territory. We were in, uh, on an island and there were uh, people up on, on the bank there and they came down to see, they must have heard the crash. When they got there, they, uh, we couldn't understand them, and they couldn't understand us. But the first thing they wanted to know, they'd, they'd point to each one of us five and then point to the, out there, the airplane. We figured they wanted to know if there were any more of us in the airplane. We somehow or other convinced that there was just the five of us. Then they helped us up to some, some houses up there and stayed overnight. The next morning, the other four of the crew, they were so badly injured that they could not walk. So they had to rig up a sort of a pallet fastened to a bamboo pole so they could sit on that to be carried. And it's carried by two Chinese coolies. And we left there. Well, during the night then I went back out the airplane, tried to get the first aid kits out of there, but uh, the tide had come in and the airplane was out in the water. Then the next morning about daylight, I went back out there and see, I could see what happened to the airplane. Both engines were torn out and quite a ways from the airplane. And the front end of the airplane was smashed flat, clear back to the leading edge of the wing. We must have hit the bottom when we turned over to do that much damage. We left there about 11 o'clock in the morning. There was a, the Chinese underground were working on it, were on that on that island. They got us out of there. We started to cross the island, and then we found out later that the Japanese landed 65 Jap soldiers at that spot where we crashed. But we were, had a head start on them. Went across the island and got to the mainland two days later. There was no medical facilities, whatever, there. And then it took us another day to get to the hospital at Lin Hai. There was an uh, English missionary and his wife were there, and they were could interpret for us. A Chinese doctor and his and his father were the doctors in that hospital. 
another crew, number 15, had made a good water landing on another island out farther than from the mainland than where we were. They, the airplane floated for eight minutes, so they had plenty of time to get their life raft out, get all the equipment on the on the raft. But as they pushed it off the wing, in the landing, a sharp edge of one of the flaps had turned up, so it punctured the, the one half of the life raft and it dumped everything in the water. But they were able to cling to the life raft until they got to shore then. My pilot, or co-pilot Dean Davenport had given the guerrilla leader on the island that we had crashed on his passport. So the Chinese brought this other crew, they were at, on the island we were on, and they knew we were, we were ahead of them. They had the only medical doctor aboard on the raid, and he was able to stay there at the hospital with the rest of my crew. Uh, Ted Lawson, the pilot, had to have his leg amputated at that hospital because gangrene had set in with no medical attention for two or three days. So that well, was Ted Lawson who had his leg amputated. I should tell you that one of the crew members, uh, the doctor that uh, Davey mentioned, uh, went wanted to go on the raid, but they, the uh, Major Hilger, the second in command of the raid, uh, said, Doc, uh, we'd like to have you, but there's no room for you on a crew. We're not going to put six men on one crew. Uh, he said, if you were a gunner, you could go. But Doc said, well, I will qualify as a gunner, and he did. And that's how he went on that crew number 15 to get to the point of being at the hospital when Ted Lawson came in with his leg badly shattered. And Doc White gave him blood from his own arms to save Ted Lawson's life. And he and Davey got the Silver Star for their bravery in assisting Ted Lawson's crew. Now, you don't find much about that in any book, any book except mine. But Davy and Doc White, no longer with us, deserve exceptional credit, and they got the Silver Star for their duty.